Um, okay, hi everyone. Um, so today I'm going to talk to you about uh, CO2 storage in Australia and the way that we can use this technology to reduce our CO2 emissions uh, to the atmosphere uh, and at the same time secure our energy uh, future, uh, our future energy resources. Uh, the work I'm going to show you uh, focuses on a small part of the work uh, that's been done here at GA and of course really focuses on uh, work that I've been involved with. So first, I want to acknowledge uh, the people that I've collaborated with over the last 13 years or so, uh, either collaborators, co-authors, or mentors. Uh, the, uh, these are some of the names that have been involved with the work that I'm presenting today. Uh, so first, the group at GA. Uh, it's, evol it's evolved a lot over the last 13 years through the ups and downs of CCS. Uh, but for many of those years, Andrew Feitz has been uh, the head of the section and has really been proactive and influential uh, to set up a lot of the exciting projects that we're working on today. Uh, I also want to thank the general support I've received from the management uh, at GA, from branch heads to um, division chiefs and CEOs during my time here. Uh, we've also had a close association with the CO2 CRC since the beginning of my time. Um, people like uh, Sandrine Vidal Gilbert and Fr uh, Peter Van Ruth really taught me a lot about applied uh, geomechanics in the early days. Uh, then there's the great team from CSIRO that I've collaborated with closely over the years, mainly on the Otway project. Um, finally, there's a group of external collaborators that have um, brought some outside skills and knowledge um, that have really improved our outputs. Um, I figured I'd just quickly go through my background, uh, although it was a very long introduction, so I hope I'm not uh, covering it too much. Um, and quickly summarize what I've worked on since uh, being a GA. Uh, so I came to Australia in 2001 to work at the ANU as a postdoc after doing a PhD in New York. Uh, at ANU, I was doing high pressure experiments to try and understand how chemical reactions in the subsurface affect the rheology and uh, strength of rocks. A lot of the work I was doing was focused on fault zones and understanding how the strength and permeability uh, would be expected to evolve with time. Um, little did I know at the time that, that a lot of this work was really relevant to, CC, to the CCS field, uh, where faults can have a big impact uh, on the success of a project. Uh, after six years of postdocing, I came to GA to work on CCS projects, uh, mainly related to the CO2 CRC uh, Otway project uh, at the beginning. Uh, looking at things like fault stability um, at the Otway uh, site, uh, general geomechanics of um, uh, of potential CO2 storage plays. I also did some work on the Iona gas storage facility in Victoria, which is storing methane uh, gas underground. Uh, I also worked on uh, developing some new methodologies for geomechanics and, uh, and CCS. Um, I also did a little bit of work on an unconventional play in the Georgina Basin as well. Then more recently, uh, I was involved in the early work we did on, on hydro hydrogen prospectivity mapping uh, together with Andrew Feitz. Um, and most recently, we've been looking at the potential to apply CO2 enhanced oil recovery techniques to Australian basins to help secure our hydro uh, hydrocarbon resources, uh, but also to try and store as much uh, CO2 as possible as part of the process. And I'll talk about that in, in this talk. So here's the outline of the talk. Uh, I'm first gonna talk uh, about CCS and why we wanna do it. Uh, then I'll talk about the main projects in Australia uh, and briefly the current state of CCS in Australia. Uh, then I'll get into a couple of the projects I've worked on since being here at GA. Uh, a lot of that on the CO2 CRC uh, Otway International Test Facility. Uh, and also uh, the recent work the group has been doing on enhanced oil recovery uh, and associated CO2 storage. Um, and I'll finish off by talking about the next couple of years and the work we're doing as part of uh, EFTF. So looking into the future, uh, it's very likely that fossil fuels will continue to play some role in the global energy mix for decades to come. Uh, however, to bring down emissions significantly is going to require a number of technologies to be implemented. Um, so the red line, uh, at the top uh, in this slide is showing the emissions trajectory that we're currently on. Uh, the line below that is the tra trajectory we'll hit if all the countries meet their stated targets. Then to change that curve to the green line at the very bottom, 
where we're actually reducing emissions over time um, is going to require growth in various low emissions technologies. Uh, there are various efficiency measures that are listed in blue there. Um, then there are the various renewables uh, shown in green. Uh, then we have alternative fuels in yellow, um, most notably hydrogen, which has really taken off in the last couple of years. Um, then finally, we have uh, carbon capture, utilization and storage, uh, which uh, we also need uh, to make a contribution. So this is not uh, an either or situation. Um, CCS is one of the many tools that will be required if we're going to reverse the emissions problem. Uh, and this has been stated very clearly by the International um, Panel on Climate Change. Okay, so what is carbon capture and storage? Um, well, the concept is simple. Uh, you capture CO2 from various sources that are emitting lots of CO2 and then bury it deep underground in various geological formations. Uh, typical sources that you might want to capture CO2 from are coal or gas-fired power stations, cement plants, LNG facilities, aluminium smelters, uh, and more recently we've heard about capturing CO2 from hydrogen production facilities that use gas uh, as the power source. Uh, the most common formations that you'd be looking at injecting into are depleted oil and gas reservoirs uh, and deep saline aquifers. Uh, in the case of depleted oil or gas reservoirs, you know with a great degree of confidence that the CO2 will stay put for a long time because initially these structures held hydrocarbons uh, for tens of millions or, or, or years or much more. Um, and I should emphasize that when you inject the CO2, you're, you're not injecting into underground caverns like some people seem to think. You're injecting into the intergranular pore space in the rocks. So kind of like when you're at the beach, you pour water into the sand and it disappears quickly into the pores between the grains, between sand grains. When you're injecting uh, CO2 into a subsurface formation, there are actually different trapping mechanisms that occur over thousands of years. Initially, you have structural or stratigraphic trapping uh, that occurs. So basically the CO2 is staying in the subsurface because you have a porous rock as the reservoir, uh, which is overlain by an impermeable seal, which prevents the CO2 from coming up to the surface. Also in the early stages, you have something called residual trapping where the CO2 is immobile because of capillary forces between the gas uh, and the, the rock water system. Then after that, over time, you eventually get solubility trapping where the CO2 dissolves into the water within the reservoir, which means that it no longer has any buoyancy force to rise towards the surface. In fact, the water becomes more dense. Then finally, the last stage, uh, which occurs over longer periods of time, uh, thousands of years later, is the precipitation of carbonate minerals from the CO2 rich fluids. Um, carbonate minerals are the most thermodynamically stable form for the CO2, which means that the CO2 is then locked up permanently. The final thing I'll say about the basics of CO2 storage um, regards the depths required to do CO2 storage. So when we're talking about storing CO2 underground, we're not talking about injecting it close to some shallow aquifer. In order for this to work, it has to be at a depth of about a kilometer or more. That's because the density of CO2 changes dramatically uh, from the Earth's surface to about um, one kilometer. So as you can see on the left figure at the surface, it pretty much has a, a density of zero and takes the form of a gas, obviously. Uh, it remains a gas down to about 800 meters, at which point it changes to a supercritical fluid. So a supercritical fluid is something undefined between a gas and a liquid and has a much higher density. Um, this means that you can fit much more CO2 into a given volume and the gas will also have uh, much less buoyancy which will reduce uh, any migration up for upward, which is what you want. So what's going on in Australia these days when it comes to CCS projects? Uh, well, there have been a number of projects that have been looked at over the past couple of decades. Some have been shown not to be suitable. Others were scoping studies, looking at the potential and so on. But here's a list of projects that are currently relevant or at an advanced stage. Uh, 
The CO2 CRC Zotway project has been around for nearly a couple of decades now, and they've been doing groundbreaking research into uh, CCS. Um, over the years, it's been funded by a combination of government, industry, and academic uh, funds, and now it's being uh, operated as a private company. Uh, one of the biggest commercial projects in the world is the Chevron-led um, uh, LNG project. Uh, here, they're stripping CO2 from natural gases during LNG production and injecting into a deep aquifer formation below Barrow Island. Um, I believe the end target is to inject about 5 million tons of CO2 per year, um, which is a significant volume. Uh, the final project I'll mention specifically is the CarbonNet project in Victoria. Uh, here they've identified a geological structure offshore that is suitable for CO2 storage. Um, in Victoria, there's a lot of CO2 that needs a, a final resting place. Uh, there are a lot of coal-fired power plants, for example, that would be good to link up to a storage site. Uh, but more recently, there's also been uh, the uh, hydrogen energy, energy supply chain project. Uh, which plans to make hydrogen from brown coal and in order for the hydrogen to be clean you need to couple that facility up with a storage site so the carbon net project would be the obvious choice there so over the years uh, ccs has been through many ups and downs in terms of uh, financing enthusiasm and, and so forth uh, but in the past couple of years it's really taken off again uh, less than a year ago, or about a year ago, I think, uh, the government released its uh, technology investment roadmap. And there are a number of things in the uh, in the document that were very relevant to CCS. Um, firstly, there's this target of trying to get to reasonably priced hydrogen, so $2 per kilo or less. And currently, the cheapest way to produce hydrogen is from steam methane reformation uh, using gas. Uh, but to make this clean, you will need carbon storage. Uh, then they specifically uh, specifically talk about um, achieving cheap transport and storage of CO2 um, uh, directly. That that's something that we've been working on for a long time. Uh, when I say we, I mean uh, you know people in general. Um, then uh, so in, in the document they uh, they state that they want to get co2 compression hub transport and storage to under 20 dollars uh, per ton of co2 um, also in the document is energy storage which would uh, could be storage of hydrogen or methane underground which although not directly ccs requires the same uh, capability and know-how uh, then finally, we have low emissions steel and aluminium, which could either be renewables driven or via current methods with, with CCS. Okay, so now I'm going to get into the more technical side of the talk. Um, so when I first came to GA in, in 2007, uh, I was hired to work on projects related to the CO2 CRC's research program. The CO2 CRC was a Commonwealth Cooperative Research Program uh, formed in the early 2000s. And their goal was to conduct research and experiments to try and accelerate the CCS industry and tackle some of the complex issues related to underground storage. Um, one of the amazing things about the CRC is that they developed this natural test facility in Victoria near Port Campbell. So for those of you not aware of the geography, uh, here is a map showing its location. Uh, this is a bit of an old map, um, which uh, only shows two of the early wells drilled, but recently we're up to five deep wells and two shallower wells that are part of a controlled, controlled release uh, project that Andrew Feitz is leading. Uh, as you can see, most of this area is grazing farmland, quite flat. Um, and actually some of the most important, some of the important learnings uh, from this project over the years has been related uh, to communicating effectively with farmers and other landowners. Um, as you all know, this is becoming a very important issue that can have big impacts uh, on a project uh, that requires field work. For simplicity's sake, we usually show the Otway project with this diagram. Uh, over the years, the CO2 CRC has had uh, access to CO2 rich gas from the nearby buttress uh, field on the left. Uh, 
which they piped to the Otway site to do various subsurface uh, experiments. In stage one, back in around 2007, they wanted to show that you could store CO2 safely and predictably uh, into a depleted gas reservoir. Uh, in this case, uh, the Naylor gas field at around 2000 meters uh, depth. Then after that, in stage two, they started doing uh, injection experiments into the shallower uh, Parati formation, uh, which is a deep saline aquifer. Uh, they initially looked at how CO2 might be trapped residually in a formation uh, that had never been exposed to gas before. However, this illustration is really not a complete picture of what things look like at the site. Uh, something key is missing, and that something uh, is the many key faults that crosscut all these formations. So really, the picture at, uh, at the Otway site is more like this picture here, where we have a significant number of faults that crosscut uh, the various formations. Uh, in the case of the deeper nailer experiments, we knew that faults would seal well because there was already gas that was trapped for millions of years. However, when we went into the stage two in the saline aquifer interval above, there were some different faults involved and we didn't know how these faults were going to behave with respect to the injected gas. And that's where my work uh, came in. We needed to use various techniques to understand how these faults uh, would react when they were exposed to CO2. Um, would they be barriers to flow? Would the CO2 migrate up the faults towards the surface? Uh, was there any potential for them to reactivate uh, due to the elevated pressures, uh, stuff like that. So here's a 3D magnified uh, view of the area where they were doing uh, the injection experiments in stages two and three. Uh, in stage 2C, which I was involved with closely, uh, the plan was to inject into the CRC2 CRC well, which is in purple. You might have a hard, a little bit of a tough time seeing that, but, um, and they wanted to try and image that CO2 plume using time-lapse seismic techniques. Uh, so the idea here was to develop a monitoring technique that could follow a CO2 plume until it's stabilized in the subsurface. And in that way, you could prove to the authorities that you knew exactly where the CO2 was uh, in the subsurface. So, which is, which is great. Um, it really decreases the risk and the doubts that people might have about uh, such a project. However, before the experiment was run, we had to make sure we had a good idea of how these various faults were going to behave, um, specifically this larger splay fault that was close to the injection well. Um, so as I said before, what's it gonna do? Is it gonna be a barrier? Is it gonna allow fluids to flow? Could it be destabilized? Things like that. So in, in terms of fault hydraulics, we applied an algorithm which is used in the oil and gas industry, which is called the shale gouge ratio. And, th and there are other algorithms that are kind of similar to this. Um, it basically measures the amount of clay smearing that occurred at a given interval on the fault, okay? So to use this metric, you need to know the amount of clay in your intact rocks at different levels and then also know the displacement profile uh, on various parts of your fault. Then using these, you can uh, calculate the amount of clay smear on any point of the fault. Okay, so obviously you, you need some software to do this. It's because uh, it'll be different everywhere on the fault. Now, the more clay smear you have, the more likely the fault will be sealing laterally to flow, okay? Generally, a fault with a shale gouge ratio over 25% should be sealing to some degree. Um, so we looked at this with two different SGR approaches, and we found that due to the high clay contents in the Parati formation, the modeling predicted a predominantly sealing fault. Then using the SGR numbers as a base and assuming a certain amount of anisotropy uh, for the fault, we also estimated the vertical permeability of the fault. So the next step was to take these hydraulics numbers and incorporate them into the static and dynamic simulations. Uh, there were quite a number of simulations uh, looking at different scenarios and, and using different assumptions, but here are some results from our base case modeling. Uh, what we found was that the CO2 plume would hit uh, the splay fault within about a year, 
and the display fault was essentially acting as a barrier with very little CO2 uh, migrating upward. Um, this is what we were hoping would happen because had the CO2 migrated too far to the south, it could potentially have migrated outside of the tenement area. Um, over a longer period of time, the modeling also suggested that the CO2 uh, would migrate along the fault towards the east or towards the southeast there, which was uh, driven by the buoyancy and the angle of the cap rock. So we published this work. Um, this is sort of pre-feasibility pre study uh, and, and modeling. So, uh, you know, we published the work and then we had to wait until the injection experiment uh, was actually performed. So fast forward 18 months and, uh, and the injection experiment, um, they injected 15,000 tons of CO2 over a period of about uh, four months and tried to track it using time-lapse seismic. Uh, and here are the results. Um, the trace of the splay fault is shown by the red line there uh, and the brighter colors above the background blue show where you have elevated saturation of CO2. So that's where your, your, your CO2 plume is in the subsurface. And as you can see by the three time slices, the CO2 hits the fault and then migrates to the east exactly as, as the dynamic simulation suggested. So this was a fantastic uh, endorsement of the modeling techniques we used. Uh, and it was also a world first in terms of tracking such a small injection uh, uh, in the subsurface. Um, and in my opinion, this is, uh, you know, over the past 10 years, this, is, this experiment is really one of the, uh, the, the, the main great things that uh, the CO2 CRC has done, you know, one of the great studies actually. Uh, another critical part of this project um, was to assess how much fluid pressure increase could be supported by the splay fault before the pressure started to destabilize the fault. Um, generally, any movement of, of faults is not desirable because uh, you can get new pathways created for CO2 flow. And in the worst case, uh, you could generate some small seismic events. So understanding how much pressure the faults can support is critical for any CCS operation. Uh, so what you're looking at here uh, is a subsurface 3D image of the splay fault uh, with the larger nailer fault in the background. Um, yeah, so um, so having a, you know having a good understanding of the regional stress and also estimating a couple of the key fault properties, we can use a 3D stress modeling software package uh, to determine the stress sensitivity on every part of the fault depending on its orientation, depth, and, and so on. Um, so we had two different scenarios, uh, a weak uh, and a strong fault uh, situation. And in this, si in this slide, the, uh, the fault is colored by the pressure increase it can sustain before reactivating. Uh, for the strong fault scenario, you can see it takes about eight to 10 megapascals to, to theoretically reactivate. Um, whereas the weak fault only requires about three, three to five. Um, as it turned out, the pressure buildup during the stage 2C experiment was much lower than even the weak fault scenario. So there was a very low risk of fault reactivation either way. Um, so that was all good. However, this exercise did tell us that there were big differences depending what fault properties we put into the model and really reinforces um, that we need more actual data on fault properties, you know, whether it's lab or field based to actually tighten up the modeling a bit. And when I, at the beginning, when I talked about the work I did at ANU, I didn't sort of see the bigger picture of some of those experiments we were doing, looking at strength evolution of faults and stuff, but those kind of numbers, you, those lab numbers, you actually need to put into this type of modeling. So, mm -hmm. um, so that's uh, a little snapshot into the work uh, into the Otway site and also the work I've done um, at the on the Otway project. Um, there were a number of other projects and background work that was done, but uh, unfortunately for today and the nature of this talk, there isn't really time to go into uh, all the technical details and so on. The other project I want to talk about um, is some work we've uh, we developed together with the CO2 CRC in. 2019, uh, looking at the potential to develop uh, a CO2 enhanced oil recovery industry in Australia. 
Uh, enhanced oil recovery is a process in which you inject CO2 into the subsurface to prolong the life of an oil field, while at the same time storing potentially large volumes of CO2 permanently. So what were the goals of, the, of this project? Well, first we wanted to identify the oil and condensate resource that's out there in Australia for targeting uh, using EOR. Uh, then we wanted to develop a screening methodology that could uh, be applied at the basin level to see whether uh, the process will work and be feasible. And using this methodology, we assessed 10 Australian basins for their CO2 EOR uh, potential and essentially ranked them. Uh, in addition to the screening, the report also provided some estimate on the potential recoverable oil out there and also uh, the potential CO2 that can be stored as part of the uh, enhanced oil recovery process. So what is the main driving force behind the EOR work we're doing? Um, well, it's about increasing our sovereign production of liquid hydrocarbons and reducing our dependency on foreign nations for our supply, while at the same time trying to stimulate or monetize the carbon storage process. Uh, this graph here shows the trajectory we've been on for the last 20 years in terms of our oil imports and exports. Uh, so on this slide, you can see that both oil imports and exports have been relatively flat. However, what has been changing is our oil consumption, which has increased by about 25%. And that increased consumption has been supplied by an increase in refined uh, oil uh, imports, which you can see uh, in the, the red line. Uh, so this path is an unsustainable path to be on and simply puts us in a situation where our um, energy security is very much controlled by external factors. Um, what enhanced oil recovery has the potential to do is limit the growth of these imports and give us a bit more control uh, and ultimately allow us to store significant volumes of CO2 in the subsurface as well. So I just want to spend uh, a slide giving some basic background around what CO2 EOR actually is, uh, as many of you might not be familiar with it. Uh, basically, it's the injection of compressed CO2 into an oil reservoir near the end of its life to extend and improve the overall recovery of oil. So unlike water flooding, which is designed to maintain pressure in the reservoir and push oil towards a producing well, with CO2 EOR, the CO2 uh, acts like a solvent and causes the oil to expand or dissolve into the CO2, uh, thereby allowing it uh, to migrate towards the production well. Um, during this process, a lot of the CO2 is recycled, but a lot also stays in the subsurface and is stored uh, permanently. Um, because of that, CO2 EOR can be a good method uh, to start, store large uh, amounts of CO2 and sometimes actually the, the process can be net negative in terms of uh, emissions. But most importantly, we see EOR as a way of accelerating and monetizing the CCS process um, or the industry. Um, so perhaps initially you might inject CO2 to enhance oil production, but with time, we would hope there would be incentives to transition to a, a pure CCS operation. So what is the potential oil resource available in Australia that uh, we may be able to use CO2 EOR for? Um, well, as you know, Australia is not a huge producer of oil by world standards. Uh, we're more known for our big gas reserves. However, when you look at this map that was put together by the Australian Energy Resources uh, Assessment, um, you can see that there is significant oil out there for targeting. Um, I've converted the, the pedigule numbers to millions of barrels remaining here. Um, so the big ones are the Gippsland, Cooper, Carnarvon, and Bonaparte basins. Um, but when it comes to EOR, you're likely looking at the onshore basins that will be the first movers um, as the costs are a lot lower to, to do it onshore. Uh, at, the, at the moment, there's only one offshore uh, EOR operation happening and that's in Brazil. So we had a, had a look at previous screening studies um, on enhanced oil recovery and using those as a guide, we've developed our own ranking methodology, which is shown here. Uh, 
Uh, we looked at oil gravity, which is a measure of uh, how heavy or light the oil is, permeability, porosity, temperature, uh, depth or pressure, and then also CO2 sources and infrastructure. So up in the top left side of each box, you can see the weighting we have given to each of these parameters. Uh, in terms of characterizing each of these parameters, we try and keep it as quantitative as possible, uh, as much as we can. Uh, and so we, we've decided on these good, bad, moderate cutoff points that we use. Um, of course, for things like CO2 and infrastructure, that's got to be a, a bit more subjective. Uh, but just to summarize for for oil gravity, uh, light oils are better for EOR. Uh, then with permeability, higher permeability with little heterogeneity works best. Um, then low temperatures and higher pressures are also better because there will be less density differences between the, the injected CO2 gas and the oil in the reservoir uh, so that they can mix more effectively. In terms of the CO2 sources that can be used uh, in the EOR process. The biggest CO2 emissions come from coal and gas-fired uh, power stations. Uh, and the per annum emissions for these stations are available from the National Greenhouse Gas Inventory. And on this map, they're plotted as green circles of various sizes. Uh, we've also plotted other high CO2 emitting industries on the map, such as aluminum and cement plants, uh, gas plants, and refineries, LNG facilities, um, and as well as uh, hydrogen production facilities. Uh, however, the, the detailed emissions uh, uh, numbers for the point sources uh, related to those industry sources are not released by the government. Um, I don't have time in this talk to take you through the results basin by basin, uh, so I'll just review some of the key findings uh, from this work. So in this slide, I'm showing the potential recoverable oil using uh, EOR, uh, using AERA numbers as a base, and then applying certain primary and tertiary recovery factors that have been observed around the world. Um, and it's really an order of magnitude type estimate to get an idea of what type of stranded assets there are in each basin. Um, so you can see the numbers we're talking about in millions of barrels of oil. Um, uh, so the Gippsland, and Carnarvon have uh, huge numbers there. Uh, also the Cooper Aramanga, a couple of hundred million uh, barrels there as well. Um, now I should say that, uh, I should emphasize that I'm not saying that that's what you would produce if you implement, uh, implemented EOR in Australia. But those are the residual volumes that are in the basin somewhere uh, based on the defined sizes of the various fields. And here's the, uh, the final ranking table that we can, came out with for all the basins in terms of their potential to implement CO2 EOR. Uh, here we have uh, the six different uh, screening parameters together with the final score uh, attributed, that we've attributed. Uh, the last column shows the overall score ordered by uh, best to worst. Uh, so the Bowen, Surat, uh, Cooper, Aramanga and Gippsland are the top three. And what really separates them from the other basins mainly is the proximity to CO2 and infrastructure concerns. Uh, the Bonaparte Basin also had a surprisingly good score. Uh, in, in this case, despite having relatively poor infrastructure and CO2 sourcing, uh, the reservoir properties and the oil properties are excellent, uh, or, or at least better than uh, most of the other basins. And here's a map that we put together showing the overall results. So each color jump is a range of 10 percentage points. Uh, so overall, we're looking from the 40s to the 90s in terms of score, uh, or actually high 80s. Uh, and you can see really that the high potential basins uh, in our ranking are located uh, on the eastern side of the country. Um, That's a little look at what we did um, on CO2 EOR in the past year or two. Um, so where are we going next with this work? Uh, well, the next step is to look at something a bit more frontier in the world of uh, enhanced oil recovery. We want to look at the potential to use EOR in residual oil zones. Uh, these are oil zones below the main pay zone, which are mostly water saturated, uh, but can nevertheless have significant oil. Uh, 
<clears throat> and one of the goals uh, of this work is to produce uh, some of this oil while optimizing the amount of CO2 we can store. In terms of the approach, uh, we are coming at it from several different angles. Uh, firstly, you know, we need to develop a methodology to identify the presence of these zones using wireline log techniques and analysis. Uh, then we need to do experiments to see how the rock will respond uh, to a CO2 flooding. And then finally, we want to do some modeling at the reservoir scale to see how much oil can be produced and how much CO2 can be stored. So here on the map uh, are the focus areas for EFTF, uh, Exploring for the Future uh, program. Uh, the plan in terms of this residual oil zone module is to start by looking at the Cooper and Surat basins, as those really seem to be the first movers in terms of enhanced oil recovery. There's already, uh, you know, a couple of companies sort of looking at it in, in both basins. So. So what exactly are these residual oil zones? Um, these zones are, are located, as I said, below the oil, the oil water contact uh, beneath the main pay zone. Um, they're part of the field that were once filled with oil, but were since flooded naturally by water. Uh, this could happen for a variety of reasons, such as basin tilting, hydrodynamic effects, or just leakage of the oil cap out of the system, which caused the oil water uh, contact to move up. Um, as you can see from the, the schematic, uh, the saturation of oil in these zones varies, uh, decreasing the deeper you go. Um, so when the residual oil zone uh, is associated with a conventional accumulation, it's called a brownfield case uh, on the right there. Uh, but there are also greenfield examples that are being developed in the USA. And these are projects where the residual oil zone is not associated with um, conventional oil uh, accumulation. One good example uh, of a brownfield residual oil zone uh, that has been developed commercially uh, is the Seminole field in the Permian Basin of West Texas. Uh, it's estimated that CO2 EOR from the residual oil zone will produce an extra 225 million barrels of oil. Uh, which is very significant. Um, in this slide, I'm showing why uh, showing why the oil uh, resource in the residual oil zone is so significant at, Sem at Seminole. Um, panel one shows the structure of the field after it was initially filled with oil, a uh, pretty standard looking uh, field. Uh, after the structure was filled, the, the field was tilted due to tectonic movement. Uh, this had the result of generating this water flooded wedge that was originally saturated with oil. So initially the residual oil zone is was rather thin as you can see in the in number two there. Then later on there was a seal breach, uh, perhaps fault reactivation, something something happened to the seal that allowed oil to leak out of the system and that further allowed water to invade uh, a, a fully saturated oil zone thereby creating a, a much thicker residual oil zone. So it's these type of situations that we're looking for in Australia as part of uh, the EFTF program. So in our recent APIA paper, uh, we put together uh, this figure to show some of the things that we see as being important, both in the short and uh, longer term to really kickstart this EOR industry um, in Australia. Uh, and I should say that these are by no means official policy suggestions or considerations because that's really not our domain. Um, these are ideas that should be considered when putting a roadmap together for the nation. Um, so in the near term, the focus probably needs to be on modeling and research and development, uh, then techno-economic modeling to see if we can implement the technology successfully and, and if so, where. Um, finally, uh, you know, early stage pilot projects would, would likely be useful as we've seen with the CO2 CRC's Otway project uh, that I told you about, uh, which has turned into a CCS demonstration project, which is known worldwide. Um, in the medium term, uh, it would be good to uh, look at mapping and characterizing specific projects and perhaps really kicking off activities at a pilot project or two. And in this stage, we're also thinking about the design and implementation of, of larger projects. Um, then finally, in the longer term, long term, uh, 
is really the emphasis on getting some actual commercial projects off the ground. Uh, perhaps also starting to think of offshore projects, uh, possibly, uh, and maybe also get serious about looking at some of these greenfield residual oil zone um, projects, which are not necessarily associated with um, uh, conventional uh, oil accumulations. So um, that brings me to the end of my talk. Um, hopefully you found uh, the content interesting. Um, there is um, so much other work that's been done at GA over the, GA over the years, um, but there just wasn't time to go into all of it. Uh, over, overall, uh, it looks like there's good momentum behind CCS at the moment, uh, whether it's uh, related to industrial emissions or uh, hydrogen production from gas. Um, so hopefully we can keep pushing forward on this technology into the future. Uh, if you're interested in the enhanced oil recovery work we've been doing, um, a full-length APIA paper came out recently uh, at this year's APIA conference, and it's open access, so anybody can download it. Um, if there are any questions you have related uh, to the images uh, you saw or, or whatever, please don't hesitate to email me. Uh, and you can also read uh, much more about the Australia Future Energy Resources Project, which is part of the EFTF program. Uh, if you go to uh, the Geoscience Australia website. So with that, I'll say thank you very much.